Let us pray. We thank you, O God, for calling us into your church to be your people. Today we have gathered, God of grace and wisdom, because we have heard from your call. You have reached out to us. You have touched us with your spirit, and we have turned toward you, seeking to love as we have been loved. We call upon your holy name. Empower us to worship and serve you, walking gently on this earth through the grace of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the beginning of spring semester in this new year. We're delighted that you've joined us for this worship service in which we give thanks to God for the opportunity to grow and learn in a community so rich with remarkably talented leaders who love and seek to know God and neighbor and serve the church of Jesus Christ. I very much enjoyed seeing so many of you in person last semester, even though we always have a dedicated group of students learning remotely. I'm sorry that Convocation today does not give us the opportunity to be both in person and online, but I'm delighted that we have convened together in cyberspace. I hope that you and your loved ones are staying safe during these most challenging times, and I look forward to seeing those of you who will be taking in-person classes beginning the week of January 31. We all have been eager to welcome 2022 with fresh perspectives and great hopes, and I'm grateful that we will navigate it with renewed dedication to fulfilling our mission as a school and our callings as those who seek to love God with all our hearts, souls, strength, and minds, with emphasis on our minds in this season of our lives. Despite a somewhat rough start to the semester for many, I know we will accomplish great things in coming months. For all of you who follow football, I want to note that last night was a big night for our state when the University of Georgia Bulldogs won the National Football Championship in playing against the University of Alabama Crimson Tide. This victory was a long time coming and even sweeter after Georgia's earlier crushing defeat in December. As someone who grew up in Alabama watching Bear Bryant coach the Crimson Tide, I enjoyed seeing a team from my adopted state of Georgia finally get their due. Congratulations to UGA. Each convocation gives us an opportunity to welcome people into our community and returning to our community. Let's start with the students. This semester, we have 18 new students. We're thrilled that you have joined us in our community. I look forward to meeting you in person and remotely and give thanks to God that your story, your gifts and talents are now part of Candler's story as we all write it together. One visiting faculty joined Candler over the January term as the Sankofa lecturer, and this year she is Dr. Monique Moultrie, Associate Professor of Religious Studies at Georgia State University. Welcome, Dr. Moultrie. I'm delighted to announce that Reverend Dr. Joanne Solis Walker has arrived to begin her work at Candler as a faculty member and as a senior administrator. She is professor in the practice of leadership and associate dean leading some of the school's new strategic initiatives. Welcome, Dr. Solis Walker. Three new staff have joined the Candler community since our last convocation, and they are Emily Miles, admissions advisor, Valerie Longhi, program coordinator, Aquinas Center of Theology, Callie Tabor, Associate Director, Aquinas Center of Theology. Welcome to these 
dedicated staff. Two Candler faculty members are returning from leave, and they are Dr. Helen Kim, Assistant Professor of American Religious History, and Reverend Dr. Danielle Tuminio Hansen, Assistant Professor of Practical Theology and Spiritual Care. Welcome back to these faculty members. Today, we are deeply privileged and honored to have Bishop William T. Bill McAlealy to deliver our convocation address. He is the Bishop of the Nashville Episcopal area of the United Methodist Church and has served there since his election to the Episcopacy in 2012. A native of Mississippi, Bishop McAlilly graduated from Millsaps College in Jackson, Mississippi and earned a Master of Divinity degree here at Candler. Bishop McAlilly was awarded an honorary Doctor of Divinity degree from Rust College in Holly Springs, Mississippi. Before his election as a bishop, Bill McAlilly was appointed to serve as the district superintendent of the Seashore District of the Mississippi Conference in the aftermath of the 2005 Hurricane Katrina and worked closely with disaster response in the United Methodist Committee on Relief, otherwise known as UMCOR. Much more recently, he has provided key leadership for the denomination's efforts to address the December 2021 tornadoes in Tennessee and Kentucky. His specialty in disaster relief unfortunately comes in too handy. Bishop McAlilly currently serves as the president of the United Methodist General Board of Higher Education and Ministry, and he is vice president of the Emory University Board of Trustees. He is married to Lynn McAlilly, and they have two adult children, one of whom is also a Candler graduate and five grandchildren. I've known Bishop McAlilly all of his life. When we were growing up, our fathers attended Candler at the same time and served local churches together as student pastors. Notice, please, that there are three generations of McAlillys who've graduated from Candler. Bill's family and my family frequently took vacations together, visited each other often across the years, and relished in the joy of good humor and fun times. In a touching convergence, our fathers, who were in their late 80s, died within days of each other in 2018. Throughout their lives, they were deeply dedicated to the gospel of Jesus Christ and its emphasis on love, grace, justice, and mercy for all. And they instilled that passion in us too. Bishop McLilly is described as having a pastor's heart with a vision for the reign of God. And I'm delighted to welcome him back to Candler today to deliver the convocation address. Wesh, welcome Bishop McAlilly. We look forward to hearing from you a bit later.
I invite you to rise as you are able, wherever you are, for the reading of our gospel scripture from Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. And it reads, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Grace and peace to you from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. What a joy it is for me to join with you in this spring convocation and have the honor, the deep honor, of speaking with you today and worshiping with you. I am uh, deeply honored by Dean Love's introduction and her friendship over a lifetime. Uh, I invited Dean Love to preach at the first annual conference of my uh, tenure as bishop in Tennessee, and when she rose to begin her sermon, she said, I changed Bishop McAlilly's diapers. Now, that is a bit apocryphal and somewhat embellished. Okay, we're going to do this this way. Okay. Nonetheless, I'm so glad to be here. I'm thankful for this university uh, and for this divinity school and my relationship with the school over time. Uh, I'm most proud of the way in which uh, my son uh, was formed and shaped in his ministry in, in most recent times. He is serving faithfully in Mississippi, and I'm so grateful for that. In the fall of 1978, I walked on this campus for the first time. Jim Laney was president of the university. Jim Waits was dean of the Divinity School and as luck would have it became my faculty advisor. I don't know how that happened exactly but that was the case probably because Jim Waits and I both are from Mississippi and he saw my name in the roster of new students and he ch I almost believe that he chose me uh, as his advisor. E. Gas prices were 46 cents a gallon. I was commuting 50 miles one way from Gainesville, Georgia to Emory where I was serving as a staff member at Gainesville First United Methodist Church and to Dean Love's point, the University of Georgia had not yet won a national championship. But I digress. I came to this place, this university, this theology school because God had placed in my heart of hearts a call upon my life to serve the United Methodist Church. I came because I was giving my life to Christ and was leaning into my call to serve the church and my deepest sense of who I was and who I was becoming was a servant of Christ longing to serve the church in the world through the United Methodist Church. I came desiring to be shaped and formed and guided by the faculty of this institution to equip me for the work of ministry. I came to this place most of all because I had a deep affection for Jesus Christ and I love the church. After all, why would you attend any other seminary other than the best, right? That's why you all have come. I love the church because at my baptism, the church named me and claimed me. The church gave me roots, place, and belonging, as Ken Callahan used to say when he was teaching church administration here when I was a middler. 
I imagine today as I came to this service, all of you filling this chapel, and I've tried to think about who you were and whose you were and what call was upon your life as you thought about your life in ministry and into the future. What longings did you bring or do you bring? What callings are on your life? What are your hopes? What are your dreams for ministry, for the church, and for the world? Someday I would love to have the time to sit with you and listen to those longings, to listen to those calls, to hear your hopes, to know your dreams. This is perhaps the most challenging time in the last 50 years to say yes to a call to ministry, and yet here you are, and you are deeply needed to help transform the world and the church into the image and likeness of Christ. And yet, you walk into an uncertain future filled with faith and doubt, I'm sure, hope and fears. In this liminal season between what the church was in 1978 and what the church is becoming requires an extraordinary reliance upon at least two things. Number one, I think it calls upon us to have clarity. Bob Johansson has written about clarity over certainty. I believe that clarity trumps certainty in this rapidly changing world of ours. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with Simon Sinek's book, Start With Why, How Great Leaders Inspire Everyone to Take Action. I believe we need clarity about our why. The second aspect of our need in this moment is our faith, deep faith. Faith that God is at work in us and through us in a global denomination that is seeking to redefine itself but cannot move forward in any significant way in this wilderness season of a global pandemic. And I claim that as a United Methodist who is seeking to serve an uncertain future. I am a Hebrews 11 kind of guy. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things we cannot yet see. And so we travel by faith. The church I was ordained to serve and the church I am now serving as a bishop are very different churches, which makes the task of theological education critically important as we teach students the essential task of thinking theologically and imagining 40 years hence and what it will be like to be faithful to Christ in the world, fast forwarding what is to come, we do not know yet. So I say to students this morning, soak up every ounce of wisdom you can during the time that you are here because those of you who are preparing to be pastor serving churches, if it hasn't happened already, in the next three to five years it will. You will be faced with some experience of brokenness in the life of someone you hardly know who will invite you into their lives and that whatever you thought you knew about ministry will be pennies and nickels. And the world, as fast as it is changing, the human condition has not. And so it's critical that you have clarity about your why. But before Simon Sinek started, wrote about starting with your why, God was at work forming a people who knew their why. Throughout the Old and New Testaments, God consistently was inviting persons to follow. And you look at some of those who stepped out in faith and stepped into the flow of God's future, and you don't feel quite so bad about yourself or your classmates. There are some characters that even God could use. And maybe that's true of us as well. I'm drawn, since we've just raced through the season of Advent, I'm drawn to that beginning story in the book of Luke when John starts out his ministry and he preaches a fire and brim sermon as a voice crying in the wilderness pointing to the one whose sandals he was not worthy to untie. I think of the motley crew that follow with John in that moment and says to us, get ready, one is coming. And that one did come, and the world has not been the same. John was clear about his why. Jesus was clear about his. So you go to the text, which is our centering text for this day. Imagine this hometown boy, he's come home. He's been given the opportunity to read from the lectionary. He reads from Isaiah the appointed text for the day. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he's anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he's run out of town for the sermon. My students, be careful when you go back to your home church. The folks who you, you will be preaching to will not have had the benefit of a theological education and they will not have the theological underpinnings of what Luke 4 really is about. You will be equipped with a theological education and it might get you run out of town, but you will be in good company. If you're wondering the why of the gospel, it is here in Luke 4 in these few verses. John knew his why, Jesus knew his why. Nine years ago, I raised my hand for this dawning opportunity of being a bishop in the United Methodist Church, and I did so because of my why. Eleven months earlier, our son and daughter-in-law had adopted a son, Thomas. And as I was leading up to my election as bishop, I kept thinking about Thomas. I kept praying about the kind of church Thomas would inherit, what kind of children, church his children and his grandchildren would inherit. Well, since that time, our tribe has increased. We have Micah and Bo and Iris and Mac now, five, all under ten. But I have to confess to you, I've had a few moments over the last couple of years when I have questioned my why. It's naive to think that when we understand the why of our lives, God will make the path easy. John the Baptist is arrested, Jesus is crucified. What should we expect? We're often questioned more and more. My why as a leader in the church is being questioned. You follow this path, yours will be too. But every time it does, I feel as if everything I've given my life for is being questioned. Every child I've ever prayed for, every teenager who ever knocked on my door late at night because she was afraid to go home, every sermon I've ever preached, every hand I've ever held at a hospital side, who God has called me and equipped me to be is being questioned. We are in that kind of season, friends. And if my why has wavered, I have to wonder if those of you who are matriculating through Canada theology school have questioned your why. After all, what is theological education? The purpose of theological education is not to take your doubts and your difficulties, your aspirations and your dreams and place them in a crucible that gives you the tools to be a continuous learner on the road to holiness of heart and life. I think that is the task of theological education. Hopefully along the way you'll experience a little bit of grace. If not from your classmates, maybe from a professor or two. Last month, December 4th to be exact, I, we had a very important meeting in the Tennessee Conference of the United Methodist Church. We were merging the two conferences, the work that I was sent to Tennessee to do to bring the Memphis Conference and the Tennessee Conference together under one umbrella. It was nine years of work, nine years of prayers, 900 conversations. 900 debates, and on it goes. Early that morning on December 4th, I woke up. I had been dreaming. The dream was not some Damascus Road experience, but rather it was clear enough for me to understand. The dream maker offered me a message in the dream. The messenger said, tell them Matthew 22 and Matthew 28. Well, all good Methodist biblical scholars know what Matthew 22 is and Matthew 28 without me saying Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 28, go into all the world and make disciples of Jesus Christ, baptizing, preaching, teaching. I knew immediately what I was to do. After all, are these not the foundational scriptures of Wesleyan theology? But I have to add Matthew 25 in the midst of 22 and 28. When did we see you hungry? When did we see you thick? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you in prison? So the question lingers for me, what now in this season shall we do? Sharpen your clarity, deepen your faith. Hold fast to Matthew 22, practice Matthew 25, go into a 
world in a Matthew 28 kind of way. I love in Matthew 28, it begins by saying, they gathered for worship and some doubted. And then immediately afterward, you get the Great Commission. That gives me great comfort for you theological students who don't have your act together before you receive your diploma and you're sent out into the world to serve the church because you probably will go forward with some doubt. And yet, God will be with you. God's call upon our lives is not difficult to understand. Love God, love those God loves. Take care of the poor, the broken, the imprisoned. Make disciples by offering Christ to all those God is bringing to you. Do that which God is holding before you. As you walk through your theological education in this uncertainty, know this, God is at work yet in the world. And when the world is bombarded with messages that are the antithesis of the gospel, look closely, you will see God is at work creating, birthing, resurrecting. However, on your way from here to where God is leading, you pay attention. The church will need you to be as much a missionary as a minister. You liturgical experts know that last Sunday was the baptismal of the Lord. It's in our baptism we find our identity. My friend Davis Chapel, pastor at Brentwood United Methodist Church, reminded me recently that Eric Erickson coined the term 60 years ago when we started down the slippery slope of pigeonholing people in one category or another regarding identity. It may well be that in our desire to know who we are rather than the broad, we rather try to broaden our understanding of ourselves with labels. We do so by race, by gender, by geography, by class, by po politics, by religion. I've been judged myself because I'm from Mississippi and I talk a little slow. And sometimes in the midst of all of that, we lose our Christian identity. Jesus established his wine, his baptism first, and so do we. He's, he established identity secondly in Luke 4 in this text. When the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he's claiming his identity and his call and his mission. I would suggest to you that our identity comes first in our baptism as well. The Greek agapetos means divinely loved. That's our core identity despite what the culture may tell us. And if the nature of God is love, then the nature of those created in the image of God is also love. And that means all of us, all shapes, all colors, all genders, all identities, all of us. To be loved, to love is to be human. And to be unloving is to be inhumane. So to know your why is to know you are beloved and to see others as beloved. It is not I think therefore I am as Descartes said, but it is rather when Jesus went home and picked up the scroll and said the spirit of the Lord is upon me, it's if he's saying it is love therefore I am. It's a Matthew 22 world, it's a Matthew 25 world, it's a Matthew 28 world. Do these and you will know what God's giving you as your why for this season. Do not be afraid, for I have redeemed you, says our Lord. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and the flames will not overcome you. So fear not. And know, with clarity, with faith and certainty, without certainty, but clarity and faith, you are chosen for this moment. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of grace and God of glory, we have gathered at this moment in your presence, even though we are once again scattered in many places. We claim the witness of the psalmist 
Where can we go from your spirit? Where can we flee from your presence? Even at the farthest limits of the sea, even there, your hand leads and holds us fast. As we begin this new semester, pour out your Holy Spirit to encourage us to mend our weary spirits. Renew our passion to love and serve you with our whole heart, mind, and soul. Grant us a spirit of compassion and resilience in these challenging times. Revive within each of us the desire to live out your divine call placed on our lives. And help us to navigate this time with an abundance of grace for one another and for ourselves. Oh God, fix in us your humble spirit. Tune our hearts by the leading of your spirit that we might be engaged in the holy work of proclaiming freedom and recovering of sight and setting the oppressed free. Strengthen us for this work of justice and peace and reconciliation. And now at the start of this semester, we lift to you our students, that they may be formed and transformed through their Candler experience. We lift to you our faculty, our staff, administration, that they may be inspired to serve with excellence in the coming months. And today, we also remember and we pray for those in our community and world who are in need of healing and hope. For those who are confined to hospital rooms or homes with various forms of COVID. For those who are grieving loss. For those whose lives are ebbing away. For those who are victims of natural disasters or winter storms, political violence, all manner of systemic oppression. Hear our prayer. And we offer our prayer to you in the name and with the Spirit of Jesus the Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. And now in these tough and challenging times, go with the clarity of your call and your faith that God will always lead you. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.